we're in a very interesting time right now, culturally and in the fashion industry, and um, for all of us personally who care about the natural world, in that it's like a crunch point. Look what's happening at the UN right now and mm -hmm. how the conversation is moving, as it should do, very swiftly towards carbon footprints and what kind of industry we can even sustain in the future. I mean, it's all linked to the system that we live in. To me, I try to work inside the system. I work for a commercial fashion magazine for a big brand. But I also believe that we can shape a more sustainable industry and that designers and retailers and everyone who works in the modern fashion industry has a way, a pathway to make it more sustainable. I think the thing that makes it cool is emerging designers. Right. I think it's about the innovators, some of whom are in this room. Hello, Patrick. Um, in... You know, for example, London Fashion Week is a great platform for seeing emerging designers really shaking up the way that we make things and absolutely questioning everything about the system. To me, that's where that happens. It's not the big houses. We need to be careful that we're not tinkering around the edges yeah. and doing a few little things that sound good and give us useful marketing opportunities to say that we're becoming greener and cleaner. I think we do need some deep change. The current paradigm is more is more, and we see that. Growth, growth, more, 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 more. And in fashion, I think it has reached the point of unsustainability. I talked about feeling culpable about Rana Plaza as someone who operates within an industry that perpetuates that kind of system. I'm now feeling that way about flying. This is an industry in which large numbers of us operating within it, whether they're models or stylists or buyers, travel all the time to different cities to spruik their wares or buy their wares or talk or turn up. I do it all the time. Are we going to be able to continue to do that? I'm not sure. The other conversation that this opens up is this whole thing about carbon offsetting, which I'm sure if you've been looking closely at the fashion news is now the big news from all the big brands. So you've got Gucci, you've got Burberry saying we're going to be carbon neutral or this show or this whole company, in the case of Caring, is going to attempt to become carbon neutral. And that's complex. And what does that look like and how... I, I'm still trying to understand it. There's a lot of reasoning around understanding how, how that works and when people can say it without being greenwashy, all the rest of it. So Caring coming out with that declaration, was it last week? Mm. Um, that's innovative and obviously they were leading on the g7 fashion pact mm. so they are obviously trying to be the, the kind of host the global host of this conversation because mm. i noticed that lvmh which are their french rival for anyone who doesn't know were not part of the fashion pact um do you th so what do you think the mechanism for that is why, why do you think that's happening as i mentioned before we're at this interesting um potentially frightening um, cultural moment where the climate crisis is happening now and everybody knows. It's not something we can talk about as a future possibility. We're living, living through it. And to answer your question, why are the big brands now stepping up engagement on some of these big, bold ideas about how they might redraw the way they calculate their environmental footprint? It's because consumers expect it and not acting now, I think, is about to become untenable. And we talk a lot about how old-fashioned it is for anyone who is making anything, small or big, in the fashion industry to not have something to say about sustainability. And I think that that is a cultural moment and it's only going to get louder. And if you're doing nothing... I mean, I'm, I would probably say that if you're doing nothing, which we may make that charge at some of the big high street brands, you're probably not going to survive. I think that that old-fashioned cliche is old-fashioned, that somehow sustainable clothing is lumpy and dowdy. I mean, we mentioned the red carpet, green, yeah. green version of the red carpet before. So I think that you're in a good moment to be able to market something authentically sustainable. But my advice to you is to really get your facts right. Don't be greenwashy. So it really think about how what you can accurately say about how green what you're doing is and I think it would be good to try to innovate and do more than just use some recycled fibers and I know that's hard but I think if you can find a marketing point that is beyond just recycled econil or something then that's where the sweet spot is. Focusing on the cottons um, we were saying that like things are more disposable they have like less worth to the individual if they've only been bought for £10. People think less about the purchase they're making. A kind of con of fast fashion is that often um, the supply chain isn't very transparent at all. Right. And, you know, that's because I think if they were honest about how they made a £2 top, they wouldn't want people to know. The costs of fast fashion also gives us the wrong idea of the real 
cost of clothes. Uh, we have people thinking that a t-shirt for 30 pounds is too expensive, when really it's just because we have bad habits of buying things for two pounds when it's not the real cost of it. I'm Ashling. I am a founder of The New Wardrobe, which is a social network to be able to share clothes and accessories with people in your local area. We just realised that if we share clothes, like we did with friends in university or family, that you would be able to change up your wardrobe using the wardrobes that we already have without having to constantly buy new things all of the time. And we need to be honest about the people who've got an excess or access to excess clothing and people that don't.